thanks a lot, David, and thank you for taking the time. I also learned that this will be streamed to some outside sites, so also welcome for, to the outside people who will take the time. I know everyone's very busy, that's why that eye up there is in red, because it's something that we never really pay attention to, the business of pathology, but also the busyness of doing that. Um, first off, I want to mention that I do not have conflicts of interest, and that has a specific meaning to me because when discussing things with payers, that is always one of the top items. Um, I want to start telling you something how I got interested in this, and it's also part of a mentor um, you know, recommendation. So after I did my postdoc with you know, publishing some papers that I'm still very proud of, and I thought, you know, I could totally change the world. One of the things that John told me about is sort of, so what? What happens now? What happens next? The big promise of translational medicine is that we want to change clinical medicine. But how to actually innovate in clinical practice is very tricky. In particular, when you think about your grant running out, your lab having published something, you have to get funding sustained. But how to go through that door of making it really change clinical practice, I realized that financial sustainability is one of those key elements. You may have a grant, but the grant may run out. And you may have demonstrated clinical utility by how to actually get into clinical practice, to me was kind of like completely uncharted territory. So simply put, what we do in the Center for Integrated Diagnostics is to integrate new diagnostic approaches into clinical practice. Now that may not be something new and you all may have done this in one way, shape or form, but how to really make that systematic and operationalized, operationalized innovation is something that we try to do. So from an idea via an analyte to let's say a clinical trial or a publication, I think is familiar to all of you. And then that test may be validated it could be an FDA approved test, and I get to that in a second, or it may be a laboratory developed test. But then at some point, it is probably live in clinical practice. It may have to require some funding and to sustain it, but then at some point, it will be utilized, and then you have to track whether that makes sense. I don't know whether you thought about discontinuing some testing that relatively rarely occurs, but I think that actually um, is part of you know, outcome tracking and some of the possibilities. So how does that actually work? So with any of these, let's say, innovative components, you have to have some sort of key elements when you want to integrate things in here. Now, having a science background, I thought initially I have to refine the scope or I have to refine the cost. But the actual thing is like, you know, you have to have a great team, you have to have the time to do it. And all these elements have to be fully aligned to really make sense and make something sustainable. So the first element that I want to discuss is what are the major ch challenges that we need to achieve financial sustainability. So some of this may be basic to the people in the room that know or the people online that know what is necessary. Now we know that, for example, and I use the example of next-gen sequencing, but please replace this with your technology of choice, that a perceived value of a technology may be sufficient as emerging evidence that the AMA who owns the CPT codes may release these codes. That means for you know, many companies and vendors, they may say you know, our new technology, NGS, matched up with the corresponding CPT code, that is a necessary basis to claim certain things. For example, do the billing with payers. That, however, doesn't mean that you get reimbursed. It is just a necessary but not sufficient pre-requirement. Now, the scientific community is driving that, meaning you know, representatives in the CPT um, panel will drive certain implementations of CPT codes. But um, one element that is often um, related to this is that the technology may also have to be um, safe and effective. So a lot of in the discussion of you know, new technologies and CPT codes, one thing that is often related and also important is the FDA. So when you think about the implementation of certain new technologies in the market, there's two options. One is you undergo full FDA review and approval, and then you have a kit that is FDA cleared or approved, 
and you can distribute that in the market, you know, across state lines, and you have a marketing authorization for a certain thing, for example, a device with an intended use. There's also a pathway where the FDA exercises enforcement discretion, which is called the Laboratory Developed Test Pathway. There's a law to know about LDTs, but it basically means for one specific setting, meaning your lab for your local setting. And that is this thing called laboratory developed tests. Both are currently coexisting, and I get into some of the more recent developments um, soon. Now, one thing when we talk about integration of new diagnostic technologies, and I emphasize that some of those of you who want to claim SAMs and CME, the bottom line here shows one of um, the potential answers, is that you know, for some of these very new innovative technologies, just because they are emerging, there may not be the option of having an FDA cleared tool or device or technology. So the default or de facto rule, if you're developing something in-house, is that you know, the most common reason for choosing an LDT is because there is just no FDA cleared component to this. So there's a lot of controversy about what, what is related to the FDA, but when it comes to the business, the FDA product approval itself, outlined here, it is related to the technology, but not necessarily to reimbursement. It is encouraging to know that something is safe and effective, and that may play a role into the people who decide whether they want to reimburse for that. For example, recent national coverage determinations by the CMS encourage FDA approval, for example, for next-gen sequencing, unless otherwise you know, locally regulated. So when you see, for example, or when you get an email from, let's say, a oncologist you know, that takes care of bladder cancer patients, this was last year the first ever um, approval for targeted therapy in bladder cancer. They say, well, this is now FDA approved. Can we get the test and is it reimbursed? You know, will my patient get a bill? Those are probably three gigantic documents that you have to dissect out. It's a very simple question, but it's completely different milestones that have to be accomplished. For example, is this test now covered has two interesting meanings in the context of next-gen sequencing. First is, well, is it covered, meaning is there coverage on the assay? The other part is, will medical insurances cover this test in their policies? This is contrasted to illustrate that there's two completely different things. One is you have to have the assay ready to go that you would identify a subset of patients that may benefit from this new you know, safe and effective, at least approved therapy. On the other hand, to get to this reimbursement stage, you have to have the payers buy into that, meaning they have to decide that in their you know, group of patients that this may apply to, they consider it medically meaningful enough to cover for that test. So effectively, we have on the side to the right, um, the payers determining whether they want to cover the test via a medical policy. So only if you have a technology or a test or device plus a CPT code plus a medical policy and a setting, meaning the medical policy would decide whether that setting is appropriate, only then you may get reimbursement. The rate, meaning the dollar amount, is then contingent upon whether you have a silver or gold or a platinum plan, for example, with certain insurers. So the reason behind this is, and if you put on a payer hat, is there's a big population that has to cover this cost. While for some settings, only a small subset of people, for example, the scientific community, may actually want to drive this. So that is, I think, in a nutshell, the basic principle of the reimbursement structure, um, at least when it comes to diagnostic testing. Now, I want to dive into two or three elements of that a little deeper to give you an idea how diverse or how this diversification of billing and reimbursement has become. For example, in molecular testing, the AMA has established several CPT groups. So these are code sets. So in surgical pathology, there are certain tiers, etc. But over time, from a molecular test, non-specified, we're currently dealing with, I think it's over 100 now, different subsets. So there are, for example, MOPATH codes, molecular pathology codes. Those follow the classic tier one and tier two rules, where tier one is for specific genes and tier two is by complexity 
different you know, single gene tests and it's um, graded into nine different layers of complexity in terms of technology and or professional interpretation complexity. But there are two additional codes that I want to bring to your attention. Probably you've heard, if you do next-gen sequencing, that there are next-gen sequencing codes. These cover panels as well as exome and genome, including things like um, reinterpretation of existing files, meaning where you would take a genetic sequencing file and reinterpret the findings, for example, due to new discoveries or you know, better classification of variants. However, one thing that is not widely known, but it's really important, is this group of MAAA codes, which stands for multi-analyte assays with algorithmic analyses. I know that's a mouthful, but it means effectively you have a bunch of data and you have a lot of complexity and you build an algorithm that is able to interpret that. So a lot of people consider some of the machine learning tools likely, when related to molecular data, to potentially fall into this code set unless probably otherwise classified. So that is the overview of the CPT codes and all the relevant, let's say, elements that have to be in place. So what I thought of sharing is, um, in the next slide, a relatively complex diagram of how that would play into the entire field of what we're talking about. So to, to go through the logic of this scheme, so you've all been patients. Um, meaning you saw a physician and the physician may have ordered a test. The test may be accessioned, then comes the medical procedure, potentially a report that the physician receives and then discusses with you. So this layer here is what I think everyone knows. The components here are this blue box, which could be effectively any medical procedure. So you can replace this with any medical procedure. And if it has a CPT code, it is officially registered and available. Underneath that layer is a gigantic IT layer, meaning information technologies and computer systems. I'm sure you have Googled something today. You know, most physicians in clinical practice use Google every single day, but they also interact with numerous other uh, medical information technologies. For example, your laboratory and or your hospital information system and possibly some data marts, inf interfaces or other resources. Obviously, that has to be maintained, and it glues everything together. Now, underneath that layer comes what, is, what can be summarized as the revenue cycle management layer. This is all the other stuff that has to happen to get a test financially sustainable. And there are several components I want to illustrate. The patient may, you may want to know, how much is my out-of-pocket cost estimate? I would venture to say, that while probably many people in this room do diagnostic testing every single day, but if I ask what is the out-of-pocket patient contribution to that test for a certain payer for a certain CPT code, I don't think anyone knows. It's very, very complicated, but for an out-of-pocket cost estimate service, that has to actually take that all into account, and I think it is absolutely fair for a patient to ask that, right? Because you're ultimately responsible for some of the cost. The second step, which we will discuss in a little bit, is prior authorization. A process that was initially designed as a utilization management tool that will contain some testing to make it only applicable to meaningful tests. And you have to get pre-authorization before you actually get the test reimbursed. Then comes the entire billing and reimbursement with all the magnificent processes, billing and finance integrity. And ultimately, at the end, when the patient gets a bill, there has to be an accounting service and a financial clearance mechanism to make sure that patients can pay. And all of this has to be tracked. Briefly, for a test, this is a next-gen sequencing platform. These little figures shown here are the people and their minimum postgraduate years of experience to maintain this pipeline. If you quickly sum this up for a next-gen sequencing test, to run in clinical practice, you need about 55 postgraduate years of experience to maintain that. Just to illustrate what a high complexity test requires in clinical practice. Now, having said that, I thought a calming red slide would be just the best <laughs> thing afterwards. <laughs> so how are, we, how are we maintaining this and what are we doing sort of, you know, in this lab? And with this, I want to obviously thank the team, but I want to illustrate how we try to set this up and it's evolving. But I think with the next two or three slides, I want to show what that means. So the lab itself, 
with all the different people consists of a research lab, um, in this case portrayed as John Iafredi's lab, and the people are trained to effectively provide certain new developments clearly with the roadmap, the true north pointing towards clinical integration. So recently, for example, one of the postdocs developed a cell-free diagnostic test that we could easily roll into the clinical development pipeline to launch it. And I'm talking about the technology, the non-technical aspects I will cover in a second. We have a core lab for research support, um, trial and biomarker designs, and then we have an actual clinical lab um, organized, you know, as you can see here, with several senior technologists, the technical director, etc. We have several diagnostic pathologists, and we aim to balance the number of um, pathologists with a similar number of bioinformaticists. The team, um, currently directed um, um, by Marcus Herman, um, is a computational pathology division, and it's not only bioinformaticists. I think to most people in the room, you know that computer scientists fall into numerous categories. You have to have web developers, database managers, coders, infrastructure, maintenance people, people managing the limb system, etc. So what we're trying to do, and this mirrors from the left, the ideas to the right, actual implementation, to try to maintain this team and keep it as innovative as possible. Meaning one element that no one wants to do is all the boring stuff. But to innovate things in clinical practice, there's a lot of boring stuff that needs to be done. To illustrate that concept, let's just say we take a new test and we treat it as a black box. The black box functions and we have to assess that separately. But what else is needed if you want to implement that black box into clinical practice? So we organize that in a spider map or Spider-Man meeting um, where we get together and gather all the different information that's needed and we streamline this almost in a blueprint that you have to have very little work to do. So the, the idea is, for example, certain tests have certain requirements. To clarify those, that can be done before the meeting. For example, what's the anticipated volume, what's the turnaround time needs, who would order it, etc. So the, in FDA terms, intended use and specimen requirements have to be clarified because otherwise this may not work. The example is if you have a great Alzheimer protein test that requires 22 grams of human brain, that may just not work. <laughs> or, you know, the platform selection obviously is familiar to all of us, but the platform has to be available, etc. For the validation, one of the things I want to point out is it's very hard to do a validation without the samples being available. So if we have a test that's really great, but we don't have any ground truth samples that we can rely on, it's very hard to validate that. And then moving forward, the SOPs and the write-up basically have a standard operating procedure on how to write standard operating procedures. It's a meta procedure, but you know, it's, it's streamlining things. We can implement the new test by basically copy and pasting it in and following that blueprint so that it's just available. In addition, setting up the billing, we have to get charge master codes, CPT codes. If we don't have that, it won't work. Personal training, proficiency testing, the requisition has to be built out in Epic. Just having a standing Epic eCare team order, meaning a pending you know, ticket, is helpful. And then someone, ideally early on, has to find a clinical champion who can educate and tell the people this is when or why you should order the test. I don't know if you find all of these aspects boring, but it actually has nothing to do with the performance or the quality of the test, but at least for some tests, all of this has to be in place. Ideally, from the moment that you want to have this spider map meeting to actually be available, and someone has to do that. For us, it worked really well because we have some people that really like billing, um, and then they take that on and just go with that. Others like the SOP write-up. We have a great QA, QC team who will streamline the process and the workflow, and what to do when is kind of the magic sauce. Now, this meeting is outlined in red here. And this is one of our steps in a multi-step process. And I wanted to show you this and then illustrate it in an example to show why that's so critical. So if you take an idea and you really want to check whether that is possible to innovate in clinical practice, we screen immediately in our healthcare system with the appropriate people in administration to see whether there is a pathway to financial sustainability. 
That means we want to check with them early on, is there a contract? Can we modify that? Is there a CPT code? Can we go into the current negotiations with the payers and can we start that early on, even before we commit to that project or that new essay? So this happens during the selection. Very often we find that there is no appropriate CPT code. That means we wouldn't even take the project on for clinical integration. We may still do it, but then on a research basis. As soon as we select an initiative, we budget it out and we only commit currently with the team size to three projects going on at the same time, while one always has to be at the very final stages. You've seen the project mind map, the QA, QC procedures, and these steps should make sense. And then we deploy it in clinical practice. And this year is probably in FDA terms, real world evidence, meaning we launch it and we see whether it works. We track whether the payers and how they react we collect that data and then make a rational decision whether we have to put more emphasis on efficiency, quality, or other things, or whether we want to renegotiate with payers. Basically, what happens in clinical practice? One element that's really tricky, and we're currently trying to figure that out, is we want to then hand this over back to other people. Meaning, can we give this to someone else to free up the team to do more innovation? That's kind of the, the output make roughly sense? I don't know. But, um, to give you an example of how this works in clinical practice, there is, um, the setting is lung cancer, you know, next-gen sequencing, and the value of that um, has been established. You see in the top row the rough workflow. Now, given that EGFR mutations are clinically actionable, one request was, well, can we get possibly those EGFR mutations earlier? Now, Keep in mind, this is next-gen sequencing, which is, from a business perspective, challenging to begin with. But the clinicians, and I think rightfully so, ask, can we get a rapid EGFR assay beforehand? Now, two things were clear that we needed to learn here is, one, this assay could be relatively simple, and if mutant, we could make, you know, for an actionable mutation, the treatment decision clearly earlier. Now, the second part is that this perceived turnaround time of NGS testing started way earlier. Basically, when the clinician says, I'm thinking about a biopsy specifically to get the genotype to make a treatment decision. So from an oncologist's perspective, that time of idea, meaning or the, the time when, the, when you know, I have that treatment decision in mind starts the turnaround time clock. And you can tell on the pre-analytic side as well as on the post-analytic side, there are some delays that add to this perceived turnaround time. So what we did is we wanted to kind of get to this, to this workflow much faster. After the rapid EGFR testing was established that got us basically this delta, we implemented a workflow that collaboratively involves, I think, two different divisions, five or two different departments, five different divisions, when oncologists can immediately schedule an interventional radiology table, once the diagnosis is confirmed by a cytopathologist, an extra um, core biopsy goes into saline, goes into frozen section, the cancer is confirmed just whether it's present, we cut extra sections, go straight into extraction, and get a molecular result out only with the confirmed diagnosis of cancer, but not a final pathology report. And then the decision here can be made even easier. Obviously, this is a lot of operational um, efficiency, but I'll show you what happened. So the non-rapid testing group, because not every single patient was available for this, um, we made a, so this is the time from, you know, ordering to getting the patient on a tyrosine kinase inhibitor was in the control group about five to six weeks. The rapid reporting took roughly one week with the rapid test and then patients went on drug for about three or after about three weeks. The ultra rapid workflow worked that we got basically the rapid testing done in one day. So the treatment decision could be made right the next day. And then this yellow delay is because of, you know, payers having to agree to pay for the tyrosine kinase inhibitor. So ultimately we beat our own system, the rapid testing with ultra rapid testing, where we get patients on drug about a week. My dream would be to get patients on a drug the same or the next day, but that obviously requires additional modification. Now I mentioned that we do this while monitoring reimbursement. 
So what we checked here is what happens to these claims that we submit while we're improving this, um, let's say, as a clinical initiative. So what you see here are 12 private payers in Massachusetts and the claim that were reimbursed. So you see some payers really do not believe that this is meaningful or just the indications weren't right or the medical policies didn't cover that or the patient's plan, etc. But other payers adopted that, some at a very high, some at a medium and some at a lower rate. Overall, about 63% of the claims that were submitted were actually reimbursed. Now you can say, well, that's not enough or that's not good, but at least for sustaining a clinical operation, this is sufficient and it comes down to contracting, how that is possible. So given you know, some of these clinical benefits, we now can approach some of these payers and say, look, this is what we accomplished. Obviously, some payers will say, well, does that equal a survival benefit? And others may say, well, this sounds really interesting. Yes, we're supporting it. it you know, it's kind of variable on how payers react, but we at least have very good real-world evidence on how to negotiate with the payers. So what we try to derive from this is that this is a transition from, let's say, a local, siloed, localized endeavor to spreading this innovation into practice. Because once the policies are out there, they're available for all the patients, not just for our lab. So this is actually innovating outside of our realm as well. Now what we tried to derive, and this is a paper in The Oncologist 2019, um, is a paradigm for this financial sustainability. Now the paradigm works as follows. On the left, you may have your new program or initiative meaning it may be a completely basic science project or it may be something for clinical practice. And then on the right side, you have a potential funding source, meaning it could be the government, it could be a philanthropic organization, etc. Now, while you want to deliver certain things, the funding source may have certain aims or goals that you should fulfill, basically outlined in an RFA, for example, for a certain grant. Now the shared element between that is the value proposition. It could be that you just want to understand how certain BRCA mutations work, or it could be that you want to improve the health of patients with BRCA mutations by giving a certain treatment. The idea is if you draw a line from your, let's say, want to the funding source, and it deviates largely in the y-axis, it's gonna be very hard to align that. The closer it is horizontal or the closer you align your value proposition with the deliverables to the aims and goals of the funding source, the easier it is. Now, what happens with any of these projects, at some point, this shifts from understanding to you know, changing it to outcomes research to actually making it a sustainable you know, thing where payers want to pay with a heavy interest by patients that that would be the case. So what we aim for is to create real-world evidence by whatever means so that we can go to payers and say, look at this data, it is really important that you do this, and ideally the data is so good that then the payers can't say no. And thereby you shift the financial you know, burden from whatever initiative you have to a more sustainable one. I hope that makes sense. I think that values another rat slide. <laughs> um, so these are, um, I think, some of the considerations that we took into account to move towards financial sustainability. I want to approach one topic now that is somewhat distinct, and that is machine learning and some of these innovative technologies that we're talking about now, because they are very, very different and distinct, and it's very hard to show some of the value added, but I will try it. So, Simply put, and I think you see this in the background, kind of an old matrix reference, you know, are you choosing the red or the blue pill? This is referring to, are we reporting something or are we not reporting it something in the medical record? That is effectively, a, I don't know, a computer scientist's approach to determining what a pathologist's job is. I don't know, very oversimplified, of course. Now, there's a decision tree underlying that, illustrated here as a random forest tree. And when you simplify a pathologist's job like that, you can possibly emulate that with a computer tool, meaning we simulate the pathologist's ability to put something in a report, yes or no, using a machine learning classifier. So that begs the question, well, how do you do that? 
what we did. And this was a work by uh, Mick Somnier, who was you know, one of our um, summer interns, was how to implement machine learning in genomic medicine. Now this is a, a diagram of the six elements that you have to have in place. So first, you have to apply this somehow, whatever the application is, in terms of reason and in terms of infrastructure. You have to download a couple of libraries. You have to have data. The data actually have to follow a certain data model, and I get to that in a second. And the model then has to be tested, probably trained, optimized, and then you have to look at the results. So simply put, this is similar to any of the other diagnostic tools that we use, and we assess them in the same way. Here it's just a computational tool. Now, having said that, we considered our next-gen sequencing pipeline, which is you know, certain amounts of variance, and trying to portray this in a slightly different way is what we do. If this is the raw output of our genes over sites for about 19,000 variants, what pathologists do is we screen these for what we do not want to put in the report so that what's left is what we actually do report. So this is like effectively manual filtering of reviewing variants and not reporting those. So when you think about this from an AI or machine learning perspective, we cannot possibly take into account all the different outputs from a computer. Nonetheless, all of these outputs are discrete in nature, meaning from a computer science perspective, these are all already in certain bins and fields and cells and you know, VCF files, etc. So given that we had with our team the necessary computational resources, we thought that's an ideal setting to kind of optimize and test whether that would work. So simply put, the human decision of yes, putting something in a report and no, we tried to model using a machine learning tool. So to, to get to this component, we have to obviously understand what is a problem definition for machine learning. So largely put, and this is from Jason Brown Lee, um, simply put, machine learning tools or machine learning itself is a technique where a computer program learns with experience. That experience should improve the power of a task that you predefine. And this task or use case, if you wish, you have to obviously be really careful about how to define that. I want to give you a simple example. So why do you want to solve this? It may have a benefit or a use case. If you think like a computer scientist, that may be slightly different. I want to illustrate this with this clock example. The benefit may be that you know the time, for example, that you don't talk too long when you give a speech and then you check your clock. Or a use case may be that you use the time to wake you up in the morning. Those two things are fundamentally different and it's very important to predefine that when you talk about you know, certain things, um, especially when building a machine learning algorithm. In addition, while building this out, even just manually, you may actually reveal trap domain knowledge. For example, in the case of you know, what we built here, we found out that certain elements are not outputs of the pipeline, but actually previously done by a pathologist. For example, tumor type or tumor percentage, etc. So I thought it may be helpful to say that these individual components of a machine learning project would then be unfolded and done. So we took our data set, which actually takes a long time to build, but I want to show you what that looks like. And I don't know whether you're ready for some code, but I thought, you know, on Wednesday afternoon, why not look at some code? Why not? So the, the key elements here, and this is from Mix Omnir, is you install your libraries, which is effectively, you know, launching these different functions. And then you prep the data to actually look at what that means. So you basically take a look what your data looks like. And that is basically already 80% of the work. In a very good um, Forbes article from 2016, there's a great breakdown of what data science spend most of their time with. And given that you all have probably published something and you probably all used Excel, this may resonate with you because you probably spend a lot of time mining and cleansing data, looking up ages or looking up certain clinical features. So most of the time before you can actually analyze or build anything is spent on cleaning, cleansing and collecting and finalizing data what is a trap domain knowledge in there, that what you're effectively doing is you build a data model 
while you're doing it because very rarely we know about the data model before we do this, but it's evolving over time. And then the actual fancy stuff here is taking up much less time than probably initially anticipated. This has some practical um, things, which I just want to briefly uh, mention here. If you're hiring someone who really wants to do machine learning and is an expert in AI or you know, has highly you know, um, diversified skills in that, and ultimately the person is only doing 80% you know, data cleaning, that may not lead to high job satisfaction. Just a small hint, right? Make sure that you hire right and know what the person will be doing. What happens then is you encode the data, meaning the data itself may be discrete, but they have to be turned into zeros and ones, one hot encoding as a buzzword. And then you initiate a grid search where you define what your outcome is and how many iterations you want to do and tell the computer program when to stop. So what we modeled here is the F1 score. And we mentioned that you, know, you should do 35 iterations of learning, learning from experience, and if you see that there's no improvement after three additional iterations, stop. And you see that after 16 rounds of training, it converts at 93% and then this didn't improve any further. You can use different predictors and classifiers and I won't go into any of these details, but you see that depending on which model you choose to model our reporting decision, that may differ. Now what you end up with is a certain performance as an area under the curve for this model to emulate the human decision. Then you still have to decide on a cutoff, meaning you have to say, am I using this as a screening or as a confirmatory tool? And the you know, performance metrics are shown here. We decided to implement it as a screening tool, meaning we were totally okay with having a lot of false positives because we wanted to find things that we may miss rather than confirm what we wanted to see. And while we were doing that, the output was obviously the aggregate model, and you can see here is you know, not reported versus reported. But the interesting thing is in our practice, we had at the time six pathologists. So the computer scientist says, well, I can also derive pathologist-centric models. And that was sort of an, wow, wait. That means you can give us the performance of different models based on different reporting decisions by different people which is what we do when we go, for example, in a consensus conference, right? So what we did is we did an aggregate model as well as individual models. And some people sign out more, some people sign out less, and you can see the model performance here. And what we then decided at the time to do is for any variant, we implemented this as a, in a graphic user interface that you get a basic on the fly consensus call based on six different models derived from the pathologists. And then you can go and say, hey, John, why didn't you want to report this? And then John says, well, I haven't even seen the case. Well, I mean your model. Like, can you explain this, right? <laughs> so we realized that it's not just the decision that we're interested in, but that we want to go one level deeper, right? We want to understand why did the model say 99% yes? And then we wanted to explore these decisions. So <laughs> slightly portrayed differently, now we're suddenly not building a tool replacing the decision, but we want that we can explore the tool and the underlying features leading to that reporting decision. So basically going backwards. And this is now implemented. So whenever we get a variant, we get the percentage or ratio of should put it in the report is close to one, not putting it in the report is zero. And you can click on this as a link and it opens the random forest decision tree and you can actually explore the individual features and why they were chosen. Some of these make sense and are intuitively clear. For example, yes, you should report BRAF because NRAS wasn't present, but others are so complicated that you, know, you would have to know, I don't know, some meta LR rank score sum that is a composite of five different values that is in this case something. Here, for example, a primary caller low freak was one which is larger than 0.5. That may not be intuitively clear to everyone, but that is a contributing feature for a reporting decision. Now, once we had that, that was obviously groundbreaking because then we could see why a machine makes a decision on top of a decision that you may render, which I don't know, you have to experience to fully understand that. It's phenomenal, but it also prevented one thing from happening that was we were hoping to demonstrate that we become more efficient. 
But that wasn't the case because we spent our time looking and understanding the machine, which was, you know, a completely different thing. But, you know, we should have thought about that, but, you know, failing early, right? In any case, then we came across something which was also great, which is that we switched our assay. Now, initially, our assay contained 39 genes, excluding BRCA1 and ATM, which are, you know, BRCA1 and 2 and ATM are gigantic genes. And then we expanded the panel to a 116 gene panel. It comes with the spider map meeting, with all the revalidations, etc. But then we thought, well, what would happen if we just released the model as it is on a new panel? So this is equivalent to a molecular fellow switching from one institution to another, right? Learning with experience. So we were anticipating that the model will not perform well. The computer scientist said, well, you have to retrain. Right? And then we said, no, we don't want to retrain. We want to test what happens if you would expose the model to something else. And here's what happened. So this was V1 trained, ultimately over, I think, 19,500 something variants. And then it was not retrained, applied to the new version, which is a transfer test, if you wish. And obviously the performance dropped. And then we just checked what happens if we retrain the model on T2 with 568 variants, which is far too low in terms of number to really retrain something. But that was, you know, the result. So obviously there are some limitations to this, but I think what's important here, and that's probably the, the you know, take home message that is, you need good data models to really tack into this, you know, benefit of some of these AI tools. Now, one data model that may be of interest more on the AP side, but I heard there are some developments that may be relevant with respect to anatomic pathology. I thought I mentioned briefly that for image data, and that is also relevant not only for AP slides, but many other gross images, clinical images, is the DICOM standard, which is you know, digital communication in medicine for imaging data. And really capturing the metadata is one of the very important components and this is effectively a very complex data model and an evolving standard with high relevance. So I hope that this part here was clear that some of these tools applied, be it code or be it an you know, atomic assay, are really important to really unlock some of these potentials. Given that that was really easy, I thought a blue slide would match. Um, in the last couple of minutes I want to come back to how to merge these two areas. So on the one hand, we have cutting edge technology, machine learning, highly complex stuff, computer science. There could be that black box in the center, while on the other hand, we have a very you know, streamlined development and implementation platform, meaning spider map and all of that. Well, clearly there's a surrounding environment that could be considered the you know, framework or landscape of that. So to kind of outline this, I thought there are different levels and I don't know whether this will resonate, I couldn't come up with a better term, but so on the one hand we have gigantic super high level, meaning global or international level. I think it's fair to say that machine learning and AI is an international surge, a lot of interest in it. But you know this may apply to other things as well, value proposition, safety, quality, etc. So the top part is very system focused and it's a long term strategy. If you want to change a field in medicine at the international scale, good luck, you have a lifetime ahead of you. On the other hand, you know, you can trickle down regional, local, system, institutional, departmental, divisional, I don't know, your private life, and then it goes really small and like order tests or even out of pocket estimate, individual fragments of something. This is bottom up ad hoc or you know you could say patient centric. And here's a quick thing. You could talk to insurances which takes a long time but in absence of a good policy you still have to figure out how to navigate individual patients with their concerns etc. So I put here that you know a robust appeals program to overturn some of the insurances decisions can be an effective strategy. So meaning you can do two things. Now here's one element why I'm really fascinated about this business component of this entire innovative pipeline, and that is the following. In the following two or three slides, I want to try to convince you um, that personalized medicine, and the big promise of that, actually requires 
personalized billing or financial clearing processes. Because without that, you can't really realize it as in a sustainable fashion. So instead of explaining what I thought is underlying this, I want to show you what you need to do to actually get there, and then it may hopefully make sense. So first, you have to develop a payer matrix, because you will see a lot of patients with a lot of tests and requests that may or may not make sense. So here's an outline that we did, and this is a few years old. Just imagine this map fluctuates like traffic lights. These are the 12 pairs. These are the molecular CPT codes. Some pairs, this follows a traffic light logic. So red means not covered. Yellow means prior auth. Green means it's you know, OK according to policy. These policies change constantly and not all at once, and not by payer, and not according to any rules or your regulations. It's just fluctuating. So you have to have individual you know, prior auth teams that know the policies and deal with that. What that looks like is, if you don't have prior auth, you order, you do the procedure, and then you get the claims management. With prior auth, you have these different you know, rules and appeals, and you know, prior auth may or may not work, and this is relatively complex. The prior auth itself sounds like a very simple thing. But when you look at what that looks like in clinical reality, it looks something like this. So you first, from the order, have to understand, well, what payer does the patient have? What policy is the patient on? You know, and then you look up all these things to ultimately, at some point, arrive at, well, here's the date of service. Now we can actually submit the claim. This is what the reality looks like. This is the concept. What emerged from that is that a lot of people, including insurers and a lot of professional societies, came together and said, why don't we streamline this? Guess what? There are some great technologies, for example, machine learning, that we can use to do this. So at some point, some of these technologies merge with some of these requirements. Now, at the same time, there's a lot of pressure. And there's one thing that will happen. I don't know whether it will happen this year or not, but I wanted to briefly mention it. One element that is especially happening for high complexity tests is a proposed legislation that's currently existing in draft form. You can Google it, it's valid act. If you Google valid act, you get the current discussion draft. That is simply put, proposing a pre-certification for labs to basically demonstrate to the FDA that they are um, good in doing certain components, meaning that they are able to do assess technologies in the right way. By submitting it to the FDA, the FDA would review it and hand out something akin to a driver's license, where then you can move forward in an effective way. This is, by the way, absolutely, I don't know, I'm telling you like a vast oversimplification of a multi-hundred page document. But I think the actual components here are not necessarily good or bad, but it's just a force that is to be recognized. Whether the FDA and how they would regulate is really complicated. I think why I wanted to show this when it comes to integration of new technologies into clinical practice is one thing that we all kind of ignored, and I'm guilty as charged, that is we're not really providing regulatory science input into regulatory decision making, meaning we believe that we can do it, and a lot of, I don't know, I'm always thinking, oh, FDA is so complicated, but really thinking about how to improve the field would also mean challenging some of the ideas and also accepting some of the ideas. So what we did is we tried to start a collaboration. This is including the Medical Device Innovations Consortium, also people from the FDA, to really clarify and improve some of these pathways. And while it may not resonate why regulatory science is important, I think I want to briefly mention that we have participation on a lot of fronts. And maybe this is kind of a vision but I think you all know that the diagnosis is what's driving our practice. And a new technology, for example, next-gen sequencing, has changed the field quite a bit. And given that this technology derives a lot of data, and that has been already integrated into how we classify diseases, we are in a data science realm right now. However, to make all these data science initiatives safe and effective, I think one of the things that the field should move to is to really check whether this makes sense from a regulatory perspective. The regulatory sciences will have to improve and adapt, and they are, 
but without appropriate scientific input, it may go into directions that we may or may not want. And if you look at some of these aspects here, it's really important that we provide this input. Do a little bit of advertisement here tomorrow and on Friday, we host one of these alliance meetings. There's one upcoming in the summer as well, where representatives from a lot of different people, you see some of the speakers here, um, share their experience and their viewpoints on regulatory sciences. And we hope that with that, we can try to at least improve the scientific input for clinical innovation. To come to an end, I have to thank a lot of people. First and foremost, the leadership and my mentors, um, um, John and David, um, incredibly um, wonderful people in my team, um, just to mention a few here, and then obviously my funding sources. And with that, I thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to take some questions and answer. Thank you very much. Ah, oh, there's some questions. Yes, Simon. You mentioned that the, uh, the uh, vital project's going through the FDA, but isn't CMS involved in the pre-authorization issues? Is that, how do the two interact? Mm -hmm. um, so the question was whether the pre-authorization is only affecting FDA or whether CMS is also involved. Briefly, I think they call it pre-certification and CMS and FDA are both related and involved. But the issue is that according to how I understand it, and I know some of the experts in the room may disagree, but how I understand the Valid Act as proposed currently, it wouldn't touch CLIA, meaning it wouldn't touch the, the issue here. Um, is that answering your question? Well, not exactly, because I think the, uh, the payment process, the FDA has always been touching, has pretty much excluded itself from the payment process. Correct. And so, uh, the, given that pre-authorization is primarily a payment issue, you know, it'd be interesting to see how that would feed back uh, from the FDA into the CMS side. I know that, you know, some of these breakthrough designations, they work both together, and for next-gen sequencing, the national coverage determination has that, but maybe I'm not quite understanding, but I um, don't know really how to answer that. I apologize. Other questions? Yes. So I, I, mean, I really appreciated the showing all the sort of hidden infrastructure underneath a, you know, an institution that wants to innovate. And I, and I wonder if you go even a level deeper, what you think has been either uh, particularly important in your institution or a particular challenge when it comes to even things like hiring getting POs out the door, getting compliance to sign off on put, sort of putting something up on a server. Like, I, I, I feel like those are even more um, subterranean forces that, that prevent innovation that are really difficult to call attention to. What, in your experience, those sorts of things? So to summarize the question, so the question was whether there are other elements that go even below what I've shown, for example, ordering I don't know, hiring, et cetera. Um, I can just say that it is time consuming, you know, and I think there's, you know, problems left and right. I think one issue is, you know, a competency-based compensation profile, meaning there's a lot of rules about, you know, human resources and equity, which I think are absolutely appropriate. But on the other hand, you know, really encouraging talent and retainment of highly qualified people is probably one of our biggest challenges. And you mentioned some of these aspects regarding, you know, I would call that like in a big realm of administration of the lab, ordering, purchasing, et cetera, what you outlined. I think that is highly related to individuals and, you know, their abilities to really maneuver things forward and not giving up. And that is something largely, you know, it's very hard to incentivize that and, and have people who are really diligent about that. We have spend a lot of time tracking our inventory lot and you know streamlining again mundane tasks to make that more easy to to do the ordering but i think it is very very important to keep a great team spirit um, we've done a lot of you know personalysis and examinations on how to put teams together you know some people are very effective you know they are they just want to get things done other people are much more paying attention to details, and then you can have both in the wrong position, and it may never work. 
Other people are just great team players, but if you put three team players together, they may have a great conversation but not get anything done. <laughs> so it's, you know, it's like, it's a lot of personnel management and especially when reaching out to other disciplines, it's just like really being humble, like being aware that they don't know what we're doing. And it's like, you know, talking to, you know, other outside institutions, etc. It's like, you take things for granted that may be really great locally, and then, you know, you always focus on the negative things, but, you know, taking all of that into account, I think it's all a gigantic team business. And like, you know, having great team players, I'm extremely happy about my team. They're like amazing. I don't know, I couldn't function without them. But then retaining them, if a company, you know, across town is offering so much more money is really challenging because, you know, there's like a life outside of work, right, that you have to also value and respect. But that is, I think that's probably some of the, the most challenging aspects of, you know, running something like this. But on the other hand, I don't know, the, the impact that the team feels when changing some patients' lives is also tremendously valuable. We have a lot of people, um, for example, some of the machine learning people that I mentioned um, in the talk who volunteered, who made it a requirement in their, you know, much better, you know, jobs to really continue working with us. A lot of people come to us and say, hey, you know, I've done sort of, you know, ABC at certain companies, but I really want to change and add value with my skills. I think that's the one big pitch that we have, but it's definitely a challenge, but, you know, why not? Other questions? Yeah. Great, great talk, Joe. So my, my question is about the machine learning that, that you developed. So did, maybe you said it and I missed it, but did, did you look at outcomes associated with that? I mean, so... You know, is there a way for you to see, you know, what reporting is optimal in terms of the actual outcome, in terms of, you know, disease-free survival, patient or overall survival, that kind of thing? Um, so the question is about the machine learning, whether that was, you know, tracked to any, you know, objective outcomes of survival or progression-free survival. And no, we didn't do this. So currently we are, I think in the early stages, we have deployed this to just help us with, it's a decision support tool. We haven't really checked. Um, we left out about 10 to 15% of all variants without the machine learning tool to prevent snowballing from, you know, kind of the machine learning tool called something and then it's kind of self-perpetuating. So we left some of it out, but um, I don't think it's easy for us to track whether that is really changing outcomes, the machine learning part. So we're trying to figure out what is the actual benefit um, in terms of, you know, is it more efficient or is it providing certain things? So one element that I didn't put in the talk, but when in ALK rearranged lung cancer, when under TKI certain ALK mutations develop as resistance mutations, it was very interesting because in 2018, uh, roughly and early 2019, when this sort of emerged as one of those you know, elements, and we, you know, the Lung Cancer Center published some of this, we saw that the machine learning picked this up. And we didn't really know what to do with it. Like we, we started reporting it and the initial paper came out. But then over time, as we kept calling it and, you know, the model effectively learned again on the, you know, several relearning transitions so that that improved. But obviously we can't really say or link that to outcomes. But so currently I think the biggest value added is that we use it to not miss anything. So that's why we kept the cutoff basically as a screening tool. So some third promoter mutations occurred and were then called and then, you know, kept being called. And it was really fascinating because most of our variants are not in promoter regions. I mean, we covered the third promoter, but, you know, most of it wasn't. So, I don't know, not directly answering the question. So no outcome data yet, but it was definitely helpful to see that there's a certain diagnostic value to it, at least for now. Thank you. Thank you. Since you began the talk, um, about the challenge to fiscal sustainability. I'm curious how the Center for Integrated Diagnostics achieves fiscal sustainability. Is it off clinical revenues, diagnostic revenues? Does it require a massive subsidy from some other entity? You have a lot, you have a big operation. Yeah, so um, very, very good question. So the question was, is how is the Center for Integrated Diagnostics financed, simply put, and how, how are we sustaining this? So our main focus is, I mean, obviously we have a lot of support. Number one, it is, 
mainly a clinical operation on a hospital budget, on a regular you know, budget cycle. We get, however, substantial support, A, from the Cancer Center and B, from the Department of Pathology, certain initiatives, certain strategic plans. So to come back to the one figure that I show with the financial paradigm, we try, I think, as many people to use as many financial resources and sources that we can. So there's you know, NIH funding you know, for certain projects, et cetera. But it is, simply put, a gigantic hospital operation that I'm really thankful for that has emerged over the years. But um, I think it's beyond the time that we can say we're just eating up money. Some of the processes that, that we have and some of the payer initiatives are successful. Um, I wouldn't go there for saying that all of this entire team is financially sustainable, but we're getting there. Does that answer the question? Yeah. Other questions? Thanks a lot. Thank you.